Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to the Portland Art Museum for having this series at all and asking me to be a part of it. Um, particular thanks to Betsy uh, for providing answers to all my questions every time I had a new idea for tactics that I might employ for this talk. Um, it was kind of endless and she was very patient with me and I appreciate it so much. And thanks also to Sofia Gonzalez, my friend who's a docent here at the museum, um, for the walkthrough that we did that confirmed my selection for this talk. Um, I'm so excited and honored to be asked to give a talk on a piece of the museum. I initially thought that I should select a modern and abstract piece that would allow me to poetically explore without any constraints whatsoever. I thought it might be easier to be released from the facts of representation, the obvious historical context. As you see, that is not what I decided to do. I decided instead to challenge myself to find a path between the paintings you see behind me, the two still lives here, and my own life and creative work. Don't get me wrong, I love these two still lives. Um, I visit them every time I come to the museum and I think about them long after. For as much as they have haunted me, I had not until now done the truly deep read into them that they deserve. In trying to do that, I have traveled through time and space, and now I'm going to try to take you on that same journey in this multi-sensory exploration of two Dutch still lives and a whole bunch of other things. I started this exploration with an interest in symbolism of objects and a general understanding of the nature of Dutch still life painting. As a poet, I think constantly about images and ideas, and so was attracted to these paintings' Baroque darkness, their desire to capture reality to such a fine degree that the objects presented become almost surreal, supplying us with visual information far beyond the notice of an everyday glance. I was aware that the intense turning of light onto these object surfaces was more than mimetic. It was expository and didactic. The impossibly real images before us draw attention to the nature of existence, ask us to consider our human tendencies, hopes, and frailties just as much as any scene of human faces and actions does. At different times in history, the components of such paintings have formed a language, a shorthand, that to the initiated speaks as clearly as words. From gentle reminder of the nature of existence to the opportunity for profound response, our encounters with these types of images vary. But the epiphanic response seems to arise often in art when the message is disguised, buried inside of something unassuming, a vase of flowers, a bowl of fruit, a remnant of an ancient statue, I think of Rilke's famous poem, Archaic Torso of Apollo, and its magnificently unexpected final lines. The poem says, We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit, and yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur, would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star. For here, there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. Let's see how the paintings behind me want to sneak in the unexpected and give us a little shock about our lives. In this first still life by the Dutch painter Willem Kaff, crafted in the mid to late 1600s, we see everything we'd expect to find in terms of style and objects. There are many reasons to compose a painting such as this. 
It takes enormous amount of skill, control, and time to paint in this style. An artist like Kaff must be obsessed, dedicating an entire life to the perfection of technique. Imagine what it must have been like to be him, to see as he saw. Every object was a fascination. Every interaction of light with material had to be studied, first with the eye and then with the brush. It's not an exaggeration to say that Kaff composed this scene over and over. Every single one of his paintings includes the same litany of objects. A blue and white piece of Chinese porcelain, a pewter tray or vase, delicate glass demware, Turkish rug, and an arrangement of fruit. In fact, our friend here has a doppelganger, a slightly turned and adjusted version, proving this degree of his obsession. So you can see in this one that's uh, housed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it's exactly the same images as uh, the same items as the one that we have here. Um, they're just slightly. I like that. Um, I also think he's showing off, <laughs> both in what he can technically do and in the included objects here. I learned a new and fabulous word in my painting research, this word pronk. I don't know if you're familiar with this word, but as a verb in English, here's the definition. Said of a springbok or other antelope, leap in the air which, with an arched back and stiff legs, typically as a form of display or when threatened. It's from the Dutch to flaunt, make a show, to strut. As a noun, it basically means ostentation. These paintings are filled with treasures. These are not things the average person would have had on the shelf or table at this time in history. These were the best of the best, expensive, foreign, and difficult to attain. I imagine that even associating with such objects through a painting seemed to give the owner some status by proxy. With this hyper-realistic style, the artist is a creator god. It seems almost like the finer the detail and realism, the more you could reach into the composition and wrap your fingers around any of the rare and coveted objects. This scene is about the glorification of objects and tricks of the light, yes but it is also a commentary on the fleeting quality of existence. Before we go into these possibilities of interpretation, I have composed something to help us better engage with this painting. One of my other creative outlets is perfumery, so I've attempted to craft a perfume that's based on Kaff's image. Um, so let's see if it can further enhance the realism of the scene for us. If anybody has sensitivities, um, please feel free to, to not take a test strip, but I would love for you all to experience it. You can tell me if you think it smells like the painting. Though I don't, don't go up and smell the painting, I think they'll get mad at you. <laughs> Oh, Betsy, here. That one too. Okay. Thank you. Now, despite the lack of any figures, this is a human scene. The glasses will remain indefinitely, if not broken, either empty or full of wine. The metal tray will continue to reflect whatever is placed on it forever. But some hand has peeled this lemon, and it is doomed. Its sweet smell is released in the air to mingle with the scents of wool, metal, dust. The peach already shows signs of mold from which there is no return. And we know it is only a matter of time before the same fate befalls the melon. Even its thick rind is not impervious. Though a still life such as this is missing, 
the skulls and hourglasses common in the more obvious Vanitas painting. The ideas about life and death are the same. What good will all these lovely, rare objects do us in time? Life is fleeting, and all our earthly achievements and joys will one day come to nothing. Like Rilke and so many other poets have done when seduced by a work of art, I should write a poem as a means of discovering its hidden truths. I should imitate its complicated features in words. I should say the light is barely in the room. I should say something about the twist of lemon, the long coil of rind that serves no purpose but to reveal a decagon of pulp. That wine is not for you to drink. It is an offering to the god of light and dark who delivers halos through the black and makes the painter oil this scene repeatedly for 40 years. The Turkish rug, the pewter tray, the wanli bowl and molding peach. This fruit doesn't care if you live or die, it knows you are already doing both. Objects change in relation to each other, as do we in our shared rooms. The wine is redder for the rug, which also makes the white bowl blush. He finds a window in each edge of glass. When you go through, take none of this, but the single stem of chicory, a spot of blue in the darkness, the no man's land where you will walk and wait. Issues of life and death are also central to the second painting that inspired my talk today, This Flower Still Life by Vibrand Hendrix from the early, uh, early 1800s. Let's set aside such heavy topic topics for a moment and take a look at some of the historical aspects of the construction of such a painting. Accuracy in reproduction is also important to the functioning of this piece in various ways. Hendrix was actually most known for his portrait painting, the style of which feels nothing like this floral still life. The flower paintings he produced were all done in the manner of Jan van Heysem, a painter working 150 years earlier. In just these two paintings, you can see all the elements needed to create our Hendrix flower still life, from the cherubs to the nest, the shape, arrangement, and color of flowers. Hendrix's flower paintings are far more detailed and accurate than any of his portrait work, which alters the way that they are able to speak to us. The more real they feel, the more we might listen. Achieving that level of reality was logistically challenging. It is interesting to note that artists making flower still lives of this sort, rather than using actual arrangements of flowers to paint from, relied on the use of illustrations from herbals or botanicals for reference. These elaborate floral paintings could not have existed in real life. The flowers in them range the seasons, even with access to greenhouses and specialist florists. It would be impossible to have all the flowers you see here in, together in one moment in time. I know because I tested this, one of my first ideas for this presentation was to recreate this painting with actual flowers. After meeting with two separate local florists, I soon realized there was no way to make that happen. Other than the garden roses, kangaroo paw, and possibly the delphinium and iris, none of these flowers were available. All of this is to say that here, we have no ordinary arrangement. What we have here is a fiction, a fantasy, made to look enticingly real. Its creation is absolutely intentional. Every placement of every stem must have been a must. In just a moment, I'll discuss the specific flowers we see in various states of bloom. But first, let's examine the other details in this scene, which are equally important as we return to our conversation about life and death. Two obvious details, the babes or cherubs on the vase and the nest of eggs to its right are beginnings, life coming into being. If we look closer, however, 
we see that time is passing despite the apparent stillness of this impossible beauty. I should note, too, that I think that these two still lifes look even more still because of the painting that's placed between them, which is a, an aggressive scene. It has a lot of motion and energy to it. So in this context, they, they seem even more stilled to us. Um, but time is passing despite that apparent stillness. A fly has come to rest on the stem of Iris. This harbinger of death knows that a decline is already in progress. The hard marble surface of the earth is the stage for all our futile human efforts. Despite knowing this, we progress. We keep putting on a show, obsessed with the cycles of nature and also railing against them. Perhaps this is why the arrangement is towering with blossoms, an exaggeration of life so glorious it might make us forget the inevitable. He had an urge to overdo it. He had a million different flowers and one vase to put them in. He had impossible seasons in a world constantly blooming and blooming itself out. These flowers seemed to live as they drink the water in the glass. But he was tired of the beauty of ephemeral moments, the glass half full and the flowers no longer breathing. My grandmother made silk flowers, taught me how to roll the edges with glue. In her box of paper petal shapes was the potential for an iris, a frilled poppy, a rose. Silk flowers last forever but must be constantly dusted. What means more? To be given something you must maintain or something that is already dead? Silk flowers say, I cannot change. Cut flowers say, everything changes. But despite that, here, you are worth killing for. The poet Emily Dickinson also describes a version of this. I hide myself within my flower that wearing on your breast, you unsuspecting wear me too and angels know the rest. I hide myself within my flower that fading from your vase, you unsuspecting feel for me almost a loneliness. And there's that notion of the unsuspected again, that idea that realizations are being snuck in. Arrangements such as this Hendrix say even more to those who speak the language of flowers. Over the centuries, specific ideas have been conveyed through the use of particular blooms. Flowers given and received were as good as letters written and read. Flower symbolism was such an obsession in Victorian times that the painter Renoir was said to proclaim, I paint flowers and simply call them flowers. They do not have to tell a story. In this era, the use of flowers in courtship was a particularly serious matter. Not today's general, hey, I like you, here are some flowers to prove it, but an intricate, nuanced system of communication that served to coax two people together. In her book, The Meaning of Flowers, Gretchen Scobel explains, courtship then was nothing if not discreet. Within that context, flowers came to serve a specific purpose as a secret code. A bouquet might bear a message. The number of leaves on a decorative bunch might indicate the date and time of a secret rendezvous. The blooms, the emotional intent of the exchange. Given the fact that the bouquet would eventually wilt, I suppose it's more akin to today's Snapchat than an actual letter. <laughs> Although it is customary to dry flowers or press them between the pages of books to preserve the memory of the occasion that they represented. The language of flowers is echoed in the literature of the Victorian era, used as plot devices and for character development. The best example I know of this is Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence, where flowers take on a huge role in the development of the main character's personalities for the reader, as well as their relationships with each other in the narrative. 
Every day, Newland Archer gives his fiance May lilies of the valley. And through this, we see her as petite, pure, seemingly innocent and delicate. But as Emily Mengels points out in her literary flower blog, this plant is actually invasive and quite tenacious, and when spread in a garden becomes very hard to remove. This directly applies to the character in question, who seems very proper and actually meek, but in fact is constantly manipulating Archer and her standing in society. May is contrasted in the novel with her rival through the use of flowers. On one of his daily florist visits, the novel tells us, Archer, quote, glanced about the embowered shop and his eye lit on a cluster of yellow roses. He had never seen any as sun golden before, and his first impulse was to send them to May instead of the lilies. But they did not look like her. There was something too rich, too strong in their fiery beauty. In a sudden revulsion of mood and almost without knowing what he did, he signed to the florist to lay the roses in another long box and slipped his card into a second envelope on which he wrote the name of the Countess Olenska. These yellow roses he repeatedly sends to his other love can signify friendship, but also jealousy, infidelity, and unconventional behavior, all aspects of her character as perceived by, by the very proper uh, upper-class New York society. When at a crucial moment, yellow roses are nowhere to be found in the city, no other flower can be sent in their place. The relationship suffers a blow as the necessary message cannot be conveyed in any way but indirectly through the yellow blooms. So important are flowers to the time and that tale that in 1993 when Martin Scorsese made a film of the novel, he made flowers almost a character of their own and even used them as the primary visuals in the opening credit sequence. So if we choose to read the Hendrix painting like a letter. We find a discussion about the nature of love and passion. In particular, that is in the very large and obvious number of garden roses that fill in every available space. Uh, but perhaps this is an unusual love, says the almost out of place kangaroo paw on the left side of the arrangement. Passion is tempered by statements on the unpredictability of life and love in the surrounding flowers. Dominant in this scene, despite being single stems, are the frilly poppy and the dark purple iris. The iris indicates receiving a message, but it could be a message of hope or one of sorrow. The poppy speaks of dreams and death, both moving us beyond the veil away from tangible enjoyment of life. Delphinium is the swiftness with which things passed, echoed in the cyclamen's deep feelings that are already fading. Everything depicted here has its counterpart. The youthful primula is undercut by the anemone's idea that youth fades, the hyacinth and daffodil speak of a renewal of life, but Stock says everything is unpredictable, and the cherry blossom personally knows life is fragile and brief, easily blown away by the wind. There is hope, however. The peony keeps a secret promise in its clustered petals. Love, once rooted, is hard to remove. It moves in cycles, too. If it disappears, we must keep faith in its return. We may have lost some of this intensity of communication in our flower giving today. While 1-800-Flowers will tell you some basic flower symbolism, we tend to select our blooms more by color, by the recipient's favorite type, or by the occasion being marked than by the specific flower's traditional messages. Boutonnieres and corsages for prom match the color of the dress. Wedding flowers are chosen based on the bride's selected colors. For funerals, 
we offer general condolence flowers, such as white lilies and roses, presented in symbolic shapes or dra dramatic cascades down standing wire frames. So I'm curious to ask uh, some of you, when's the last time that you gave flowers to someone else? Okay, so how did you decide that you would give her those? Something that did quite a bit. Good job, okay. <laughs> and how did you select the particular bouquets? Uh, combination of flowers, colors. Um, um, and just the things I thought you would like, the things that, that uh, flowers that, uh, that uh, I found fun. Yeah, lovely. Did she like them? It would last. Yes, oh, that's nice. See, lasting, we do care about that. She liked them? Yeah, she always liked them. That's nice. Um, anybody else? When's the last time that you gave someone flowers? I gave my husband a yellow rose maybe two months ago. Uh oh. <laughs> and what was the occasion? Yeah. Is that something that you do often? Um, yeah, probably at least every couple months. But it's interesting, the yellow, because it wasn't red. And red would have been the go-to flower for that. And often, it, yes. I didn't do red, and I think it was a conscious decision in doing that. Um, I was all, I'm frequently drawn to the, more of the oranges or the yellows when I give a, a, a rose to him and not the reds. So I hadn't really thought about that. And at this point in time, you're completely free to choose based on aesthetics. But at other points in history, that would have sent entirely the wrong message, and you might have gotten yourself into trouble. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> commenting. Um, be it flowers, clothing, cars, or collectibles, we communicate constantly through the things we possess. In addition to uh, explicit symbolism, the objects of our lives knowingly and unknowingly allow us to reveal aspects of identity, both personal and collective, compete with those around us for status, and speaking of special occasions, our objects help us cross the threshold from the mundane and everyday into the special and even sacred. Whether sacred or secular, we use objects, flowers, and food to perform our rituals and decorate our holiday mantles, doors, and tables. A perfect example of this is the U.S. Easter holiday. I mean, not just practice in the U.S., but we'll, we'll be local with this for our example, um, because I'll be very personal uh, about it for an example in just a moment. Most people I know do not use pink, purple and pastel blue to decorate on a daily basis. I don't know, maybe you know, but nurseries perhaps, but generally those are not the, the primary decoration colors for, for most people's homes. But come spring, the bunnies emerge. Easter decoration is everywhere regardless of religious observations. Here's an example of uh, Easter morning from my childhood. Um, the dining room table was covered every year with potted azaleas. That was in, in case the ones in the yard were not blooming yet. It was very important to my mother. Um, stuffed bunnies, plastic inflatable bunnies, plastic straw baskets filled with plastic grass topped with plastic eggs filled with, thank goodness we finally got here, candy. We also had the tradition of the new Easter dress and sometimes a bonnet as well. Uh, perhaps due to that, my mother often liked to include me as an object in the tablescape, a tradition at both Easter and Christmas until finally I was too tall to pick up. So, right, would someone tell me, what's a holiday that, uh, that you celebrate? Christmas? Okay. What is an item that you, you decorate with, and if you didn't have that item, it, it would just feel like the holiday was not quite complete? There's some, some, some tree of some sort, some decorated tree, whether it be a small artificial tree or a large tree. It depends on kind of what we're doing during that particular season, but a tree. 
And what does that symbolize to you? Um, the season, to be sure. So it reminds us that it's that time of the year. Yeah. Um, tradition. Um, bling. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> Definitely, right? Because it's all up to you how you want to. Although, people are also incredibly specific about what they will allow on their tree. Uh, when I <laughs> moved in with my current roommate, we had our first Christmas in the house. Boy, was there a fight over colored versus white lights. Like, she won, but that's because I just... I, I, she's fierce when it comes to decorating. So, um, what's another holiday? Someone over here. What do you celebrate? Lovely. And how do you do that? With flowers. Okay. And d is it a particular type of flower that you would always have for that? Um, whatever we can find in the greenhouse. Perfect. Right. So it has to actually have emerged from nature, and then it's part of your celebration. That's lovely. I love that. Thank you. Um, so uh, both of these are, are great examples of how we use these kind of celebrations to, to mark the passing of time, but in doing so, we're, we're allowing life to be something more, right? If it was just every day, all the time, endlessly, you can imagine that that might feel a bit, uh, a bit of a letdown. So we look forward to our holidays, and we look forward to the things that we amass around us to signify that we have crossed over from every day into that special time. Um, I was very lucky growing up to have the opportunity to experience cultures other than my own. My mother taught English as a second language at the university in Birmingham, and her students often brought us food and gifted us objects from around the world. We were also occasionally invited to participate in different traditional celebrations. For me, the most impacting and unforgettable of all was Nowruz, the Persian New Year festival that we got to attend several times with my mother's former student and now our dear family friend. My curiosity then was focused on the traditional holiday table display, which was covered in objects, both familiar and unfamiliar to me at that time. Um, that's, this is an image, a very beautiful image of, uh, of this display. Here's another one. This is actually from my friend. This is one of, uh, from one of his family's celebration tables. And this display is called the haft scene, which in Farsi literally means seven S's, seven items starting with the letter S. While working on this talk, I asked our friend to tell me more about this tradition. He explained that seven is commonly used in his language in expressions of exaggeration as a way to say many. Um, it's one of those numbers we all know that is found in folk narratives and beliefs around the world. Seven wonders, seven obstacles, seven seals, seven days, seven virtues, seven sins, seven brothers, seven brides, seven swans a-swimming, sailing the seven seas, lucky number seven. And these seven offerings to prosperity and health in the new year. They might include any of the following. Sieve, which is apple, for health and beauty. Seer, which is garlic, for protection and health. Serke, which is vinegar, patience and resilience. Sambol, that's the hyacinth, speaking of flowers, revival and renewal. Samanu, which is a sweet wheat paste or pudding, which uh, represents fertility. Sabze, which is sprouts of some sort, so maybe lentils um, or grass seeds that are sprouted in a dish, um, and that symbolizes rebirth. Seke, which is coins, often newly minted coins, to represent prosperity. Senjed, which is um, so the sea buckthorn tree, um, and it represents wisdom. And somak, or sumac, which represents patience. And the table may also include a book, and often this is the Quran or um, a book of poems, the, the poetry of Hafez, um, a mirror, candles, and often it's one for um, each child in the household, colored eggs, and uh, goldfish in a bowl of water. And he tells a, 
a lovely story of uh, the growing concern among families for all those poor goldfish. You know what happens. You know what happens to goldfish. We've all had that experience. They don't last for a really long time. So uh, his family made a pond in their backyard and then invited all the other people in the community to bring their goldfish over after the celebration so that they could have a, an extended and happier life. And it actually now, speaking of plastic, the one item that, that tends to be artificial in this display is sometimes a plastic goldfish that people will have in a bowl of water just so that they don't have to miss out on this item being included, but being kinder uh, to animals. Um, it is also customary to wear brand new clothing on this day and to deep clean the house in preparation. As a child, I was most charmed, obviously, by the goldfish, but also by the plate of sprouted seeds. The image of that plate has been burned into my brain ever since. Until writing this, I hadn't thought about why it was so impacting. But I think now it was because it seemed unusual and full of magic. Why would someone grow a plate of grass indoors, something that had no other use, if it wasn't deeply meaningful? I felt the message in those green strands of the end of winter's darkness and spring's return, a message of survival and hope. On some level, I must have also recognized this as a version of the neon plastic Easter grass in every basket I'd received in my then 10 years alive. This grass, however, didn't come from Kmart in a plastic sack. This took time and care from someone's hands to make it grow, and that enhanced the meaning. So what is the difference between this and my family's Easter table? In addition to the issue of commercialization of holidays, the biggest difference is everyone there knew what each item meant. And my family would have been hard-pressed to tell you why Peter Cottontail was hopping down the bunny trail. It's specificity versus vagueness. Though the haft scene is a secular practice in Iran, and in its current form a relatively modern practice, the details of the arrangement make this display more of an altar. The intentionality carries clear messages and wishes for the coming year and performs an important function to bind the family and, in terms of the Persian diaspora, new communities together in hope. We humans are in a constant conversation about identity and belief. The way we decorate our homes and bodies communicates to everyone we encounter without saying a word. It is not surprising that we would turn to images of such objects to discuss ourselves with ourselves. In this modern age of talk therapy, people are constantly searching for ways to know themselves better. We are seeing a huge resurgence in interest in cardomancy, or divination using cards, and in the creation of new decks for self-exploration. I believe it is easier for many people to process thoughts and emotions when they are externalized, literally laid out on the table in front of them. The cards and their ideas about the human experience challenge us to identify and face hidden beliefs about the self that need to be revealed or even dismantled. The images on the cards guide us to these revelations. The Victorian era also saw heightened interest in fortune telling, both as a parlor trick and more serious inquiry. Early fortune telling decks often incorporated flower images next to scenes of human action. This is not surprising at all, given the long tradition of flowers as communication existing at this point in time. In fact, physical flowers themselves were also often used for divination. For example, one might ask a rose a question when first putting it into a vase, then determine the answer based on the number of petals still clinging to its base after it wilted. A more active version of floromancy is still practiced today by youth in the throes of first love. I think we all know what that is. Images in fortune-telling decks were eventually reduced, locating large ideas about human life inside of simple icons, both drawing on and reinforcing the human tendency to attach ideas to objects. 
Existing associations were strengthened. For example, the sun card in this old gypsy fortune-telling pack from 1930 reads, denotes a man who is humane, upright, affectionate, and faithful in all his engagements. He is happy himself and will make happy everyone with whom he comes in contact. The language of flowers is surviving through contemporary oracle decks as well. I am particularly fond of two recently released decks that exclusively use flower imagery in their systems. The beautifully illustrated Hedgewitch Botanical Oracle includes meanings for divination as well as botanical facts and information about each plant's medic medicinal uses. The Pythia Botanica Oracle is a gorgeously stylized deck that includes many wildflowers and herbs long associated with healing and magic. The more complicated and older style of card divination, the tarot, has taken a different path with the development of its symbolism and imagery. In the 1400s, the precursor to the modern tarot was used for playing a game similar to bridge. The deck had a set of trump cards, which have since become known as the major arcana. These had illustrated human scenes. The rest of the deck used the pip style of standard playing cards. Pips are the repeated symbols on the faces of playing cards that display the suit and number. As tarot evolved and cards produced specifically for divination began to emerge in the late 1700s, designs became more complicated. The pip cards of the minor arcana eventually began to include fully illustrated scenes. They featured characters in implied stories of work, relationships, struggle, and creation. Now, in contemporary tarot design, we are seeing yet another shift. There is a return to simplified imagery, often depicting the traditional characters using objects and flowers instead of human figures. One well-known contemporary Italian maker in particular has created numerous decks in this fashion. From shoes, beautiful shoes, look at these. It is the fantastic shoes, and it certainly is. To shells, to flowers. Oswaldo Minigazzi's tarots talk about human concerns with no human in sight. These flower images match ideas in shape and color. For example, il diavolo, I don't speak Italian, but I can mimic it. Is that right? Anyone speak Italian? So this is the devil card from this deck. Pass that around so you guys can take a look. It feels almost like a figure of the devil looking out at you from the card. And my friend Noel, when helping me transport this flower here tonight, what did you say? You said it looked like, like flesh. Oh, yes, the other. That too. I was, I was using it as an umbrella, but... Yeah, so clearly he's on to something, right? Getting at that character of that card, getting at that idea of the kind of bondage that we suffer sometimes as human, which is what the devil card represents. It represents confusion and fear and feeling trapped. Partly these designs are for the sake of cleverness and artistic inquiry. Partly they draw on historical interest in object and flower symbolism and regenerate classic ideas. But in the case of other contemporary tarot designers, it is a direct attempt to make the language and imagery of tarot more universal. Although tarot has spread around the world and is available for all types of people, the depictions of human action in the decks have predominantly remained in the Eurocentric imagery of tarot's origin. If tarot is for all people, why are all the faces white? There have been decks that have addressed this by replacing the standard characters with characters of other races, cultures, lifestyles, and abilities. But removing the obvious human element is another way to make a deck more universal. If the ideas are conveyed through objects used everywhere, 
then the ideas in these images should belong to us all. And this was my primary motivation when designing my deck, the Dark Exact Tarot. I thought about how each step along my journey so far has been marked by an object of some kind. I am a collector. My life is expressed in an assortment of souvenirs. From airport gift shop shot glasses to precious family heirlooms, my saved objects remind me of what I have experienced and learned. In particular, I looked back on my mother's and grandmother's gardens and saw many of the same plants growing in my yard now. Symbols there presented themselves so naturally, I knew their meanings might be felt for others as well. I'll give you a couple examples from the deck. My hermit card features an amaryllis bulb that has finished blooming for the season. Its huge, brightly colored flower required enormous amounts of energy, and now the plant must recharge. Energy from the sun is absorbed through each of its long leaves for the rest of the growing season, then the leaves yellow and die back. Over the winter, the dormant bulb stores that energy, preparing to convert it into a new flower once the spring returns. In many parts of the world, people practice a winter holiday tradition of growing an amaryllis indoors. Uh, this is often associated with Christmas because of the colors of the red and green. The charged bulb is placed partially buried in loose potting mixture or resting atop of rocks and water in a vessel. As this is the opposite of nature's timing and situation for the plant, the practice is called forcing the bulb to bloom. These unnatural circumstances tax the plant heavily. Once flowering is finished, if the bulb is not cared for properly, this will likely be the only time it will ever bloom. If the bulb recharges properly, new shoots will emerge, as seen in the card image, and another majestic bloom will have a chance to grow. The hermit reminds us that after a time of externalization of the self, such as socializing, public speaking, performing, many of us need time alone to restore and reflect. Like that bulb, we need to rest, recharge, and process everything that has occurred while out in the world among others. What have we encountered that challenges our worldview or view of ourselves? What new ideas should be incorporated into our existence? What thoughts need to clarify before action occurs? The flower depicted in my temperance card is a trout lily, one of the many wildflowers that emerge in early spring across temperate regions of the United States. These beautiful but modest flowers appear like little white angels on the forest floor for a very short time each year, then fade away into the increasing heat of the season. The mildness of the spring climate helps the flowers thrive, just as the self-control of temperate living aids our human growth. With no cultivation or other human prompting, only the go with the flow of nature, they return like clockwork the next year. This is a perfect example of perpetual patience, of yielding to the natural course of things, perhaps the most important lesson of the temperance card. When I received my copy of that Hedgewitch Botanical Oracle that I showed you a, a little bit earlier, I was elated to find the trout, the trout lily among its illustrations and to discover that my intuition about the symbol was spot on. Apparently, it truly does have a folk meaning of patience associated with it. Um, so that was further indication to me that uh, when we just listen to ourselves when we engage with these symbols, that they're speaking truly to us and in, in obviously something of a universal way. Speaking of that, personal interpretation is a vital part of understanding the cards, as well as understanding all literature and works of art. I thought it might be interesting for us to explore some personal associations with common object symbols. So I made a mini oracle deck for each of you. Uh, it uses the illustration style of historical oracles and includes objects that would have been commonly found in them. But there is one difference. There are no descriptions given for the meaning of each card. It is up to you to provide those. And I thought we might take a look at a few of the images together now to see how similar or different our interpretations might be. 
So feel free to open those up. You done? Thank you. Hi. They're all sticking together. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so pop these babies open. So there are 10 cards in there, but let's talk about these three images, which should be familiar to all of us, at least in some way. So if you encountered this image of an anchor and you were understanding it was meant to reference something other than itself, what would you say an anchor represents? Stability. <laughs> that's a good point. Right, so we have to decide if that's just where it cuts off or if it's been severed. No, most all uh, tarot cards, whether they, whether they appear upright or upside down, have two different meanings. Many people read tarot that way. Um, I have kind of a blended approach myself in that I tend to look at both aspects of a card at all times. But in, in divination using oracle decks such as this one, there typically was not a reversed positioning. That's something that's more unique to the standard tarot deck. So we don't have to worry about that for right now. Or we can worry about that. We can talk about what would be both positive and potentially negative ideas about the anchor, which we've already had in a way. So we have the anchor that holds, and then we have the anchor that fails. So we could say that it could be a symbol of stability, but also of becoming unmoored. Or of stagnation. Or stagnation, yes, interesting. That could be a perfect reverse of the anchor when you need to pull it up yeah. and set sail, but aren't for some reason. Yeah. Anything else for anchor that comes to mind? You cannot be wrong. Yes. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah, so it could, it could represent a burden. Absolutely. Great ideas. What about the I? Knowledge. Awesome. Yeah. Where do you get that idea from? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, good, okay. Okay, so something that is ever-present and watching all things. Any other ideas? Perception in general. Mm hmm Absolutely. Observation. Yes. Game. Yes. What could we say if we are going to entertain this idea of a negative aspect? What's a flip side of all that? Or a caution, perhaps, is better to say than a negative aspect? Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Disillusionment, great. I like that though, like that something is missing. You're only getting part of the picture. That is definitely a, the kind of caution that a, an oracle would present to you. What about the key? Yeah, yeah, that's a great next place to go with the notion of unlocking of something. Sure. Oh yeah, definitely. 
any cautions in that? I mean, curiosity killed the cat, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, might be. Maybe not a good idea. So it could suggest we proceed with caution. Great. So uh, I hope that you will spend some time with these and fill in the rest of the booklet. Clearly, you all know what you're doing very, very well. Um, I hope that once you have all of your meanings filled into the booklet, you'll try to give yourself a reading. There are instructions in there as well for, uh, for doing that. Um, so I'm, I'll close tonight with a final image and then I'll read one more poem that comes out of my obsession with flowers and objects. Um, what you see here is a floral still life photograph by local artist Deb Stoner. Um, you may have seen her work on display at the Portland airport, possibly. Um, but my friend Annan over here, uh, she turned me on to Deb's work recently and it is the most stunning imagery that I have come across in quite some time. She's created the perfect modern version of the still life and we find everything we'd expect here. Extreme darkness, shafts of light, thickness of flowers, and even insects frozen among their stems and petals. So this is from uh, my collection, Breakfast, number 95. Faint, but still full of stars, I keep walking, staring into the faces of flowers instead of the rush and blur. Love lives under my skin. I could feel it moving around, but now thinking has it quieted. Rosemary exploded to blue spikes overnight. Magnolias shoved their big sweet hands into my face. I was too unpolished like spring's violent burst. So pretty, so unlike calm winter. It starts the heart, but then allergies, bruised petals browning in the streets. Too soon, like rampant seed pods, dehissing when just touched. In giving you myself, I gave you weeds, and they won't stop talking. Thank you. We can have a q and A. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put this up here. Um, just, I don't know if you can read that. Feel free to come up and check out the sources. That's important to me. <laughs> um, yes, I. Well, okay. Here's one I appreciate. So. Yeah, clearly I've just made myself sound like I'm not a traditionalist, but I do collect tarot and I have decks of all different sorts from over time. This is, um, in a lovely t transportable tin, this is the uh, newer version, the Centennial Edition of the Smith Waite tarot deck. So the cards I kept showing throughout this for comparison, there we go. They're from the Rider Waite. It's the same deck as this, only the uh, woman artist's name was just not mentioned at all for <laughs> a really long time in any of the materials about the deck. I um, also think she didn't get paid for that at all. Anyway, Pamela Coleman-Smith is the person who created all of those images in collaboration with A.E. Waite, uh, the mystic A.E. Waite and the writer. Um, so this is a version of the deck that returns the imagery more to her original like, coloration and it's, it's very lovely. So I like this one quite a bit. Um, I'm also a fan of the Aquarian Tarot. That was one of the first decks that I ever used. It's beautiful. It's very, um, the, it's the colors. I actually have a tattoo that's colored, inspired by that deck. It, I love it very much, but it is, um, you know, like so many of these, it's, it's not very, uh, it's not very aware that there are, there's a plethora of people in the world. <laughs> 
deck that she created for, uh, uh, I think they even got a, one of the, she used her friends and did photographs of them in. Uh, oh, yes. Is that, yes. Oh my God, I was like, that name is so familiar. Actually, my friend gave me that deck and it's fascinating. Yeah, that was in the 70s, 60s or 70s. Well, yeah, she, we, uh, we uh, did a, a, a second edition that she was selling here in town um, a few years back. It's very cool, yes. Any other questions? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, I can't speak to that specifically at certain points in history, but I can, I mean, I work with color symbolism a lot in, in things that I do. So, I, I mean, I know in a general sense. Um, and that is part of, like, especially in the Victorian era, like, it wasn't just a rose, but it was the red rose, the white rose, the yellow rose, the pink rose, and all of those would indicate something different. So the cross over there was incredibly important, um, you know, when it came to flowers that actually bloomed in a variety of colors. You know, many of them don't, but um, it, what are you thinking about specifically? I was wondering if it's because you, I think you alluded to it being kind of a, a visceral thing, that, you, that you're drawn to it and maybe you don't know that you're drawn to it. I mean, it, it could be an argument that it's lazy or what's in season, but there could be something about, hey, maybe you just don't even, on the surface, you don't really know kind of the root of why you're, why you're picking something. So two things to that. I mean, yes, I do think sometimes it really is just an aesthetic choice in that we, we like that color or we know someone who likes it. But I completely believe that we understand symbolism on that level. If for no other reason, then we're absorbing it being used constantly. And so even if we haven't processed that, we're very aware of it just from repeated exposure because it's just so much a part of our culture. Um, not just in art, in everything, in advertising, my God, in advertising, um, certainly. So we know it's constantly around us at all moments now. Um, so yeah, I think we're just so steeped in it. So would you say that there's an, an innate understanding of it also? Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know that I believe that. I believe it's more of a, a cultural thing myself. Does anyone know otherwise? Do we, well, I mean, I suppose, it, I mean, there are, there's a scientific basis for some of that, right? Red is danger in nature, um, but red is also attraction in nature. So, I mean, the, some of that exists in, among, you know, animals, um, or the relationship between animals and plants, but I'm, I, I wonder if it's more, I'm not an expert on this, so I wonder if it's more in the human world that we see these things happening, we watch them happening, and then we take them on for ourselves. Because if you think about it, they don't necessarily apply to us. We've made them apply to us. Red stop sign, you know. Ruby red lips. Ruby red, ooh. Right, both enticing and dangerous, perhaps. Yeah, or so we think, yeah. Can I answer anything else? Where is your work showing now? Um, so, uh, in addition to my deck, um, I, I do have a show coming up. Actually, there were some cards on some of the seats. Um, I'm, I've been working on an image and text project uh, over the last couple of years. This is the culmination of that work. Um, using certain techniques of traditional writing, cross-writing, and, and work with sigils. Um, so layering and manipulating text so that it actually becomes divorced from, from its legibility and, and meaning as, as words and, and turns into image. So this show is on the next first Thursday, actually, at the Art Institute of Portland in the Pearl. So please come. Please join me. <laughs> It's my first solo show, actually, and I'm completely nervous and also completely not finished. <laughs> but my friends uh, who are much more seasoned uh, showers of their work tell me that's always the way it goes. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much um, for being here. And um, yeah, I think I turn it back over to Betsy.